You're listening to the Mind Manual Podcast, Episode 43, The De-Stigmatization and De-Medicalization of Mental Health. If you want a particular result in your life, but you're unable to get it, tune in to start training your brain and expanding your emotional intelligence to unlock the most powerful and underutilized performance tool that we have. It's the most important work you could do because it affects every area of your life. I recently caught up with a long lost friend who is still quite young, around my age, early 50s. And she was telling me how she retired from her career as an air traffic controller. And when I asked how she was filling her days in, she mentioned she had become part of a team who were involved in working around the problem of the stigma associated with mental health and the need for more access to education in managing the affairs of our mind in relation to the trials and tribulations that we encounter at work and throughout our life. She was referring particularly to air traffic controllers and also to airline pilots, of which I have a bit of insight into given my late husband was one. But I think this stigmatization and medicalization of mental health is being felt across the board in our wider society. I certainly know about the mess the police force are in. I've had two brother-in-laws who have been police officers. There is the definite issue of stigma but also the lack of education or awareness in supporting their members in the ordinary course of their daily lives at work, and then also what they go and take back home with them. The literature and studies on burnout in nurses is huge, and yet there isn't much action to back any of it up. My sister's a nurse. I work with nurses, and very little or no training or education around mental health is heard of. So, well, I thought it might be helpful to unravel and discuss the stigma and medical approach to mental health. To my mind, it's a really outdated, archaic way of looking at one system in isolation of all the interdependent factors that ultimately affect the whole. If we don't consider the whole in its full context, we are doomed to stay stuck in this broken system that, quite frankly, doesn't work in the vast majority of cases. We're going to go back to the early beginnings, take a look at the perceptions that existed, the ludicrous treatments that were being used, and then fast forward to the real underlying causes of the mental health epidemic that now exists, but yet hasn't been addressed by the medical profession or is yet to make any inroads into mainstream understanding. So on the same day I bumped into my friend, I found myself sitting next to Dolly's parents at a dinner function. For those of you who don't know, Dolly was a beautiful young girl in Outback Australia who didn't know how to deal with the bullying she was experiencing at school, which led her to end it by ending her own life. Both of these encounters I had in the same day made me want to speak on this topic in recognition of the ways it continues to impact so many lives, devastatingly and unnecessarily so. Now, when we talk about mental health, we do so in a way that pathologizes it as pertaining to the person. We mentally categorize someone as abnormal, which, as far as I'm concerned, is a cop-out. It's a cop-out because we fail to acknowledge the system that we have set up that fails to address the underlying cause of why people are finding it hard to cope with the pressures of our modern life. With the fundamental one coming down to education, we attend seven years of primary school, six years of high school, and then however many years in tertiary education. And there isn't one lesson we receive on how to manage our mind and all the constructs we create which emanate from that, which is directing and driving our emotions, which then compels us to act or not. So we remain oblivious to these drivers behind our lives and we're all feeling around in the dark trying as best we can to find our way out of the dark and just survive. Everyone forgets this part, that none of us have been equipped. We're doing the best we can with what we've got, which is not much. But instead of acknowledging this fundamental failure within our own system, 
we go and pathologize the person. So I think it's a pervasive problem that we have in general across the whole of society and one that desperately needs to be addressed and put into its proper context. So let's explore that context for a minute. When we look at the narrative, the terminology and the concept of mental health, we tend to look at it all in isolation, in isolation of the other parts we are made up of as humans, which is not just our mind, but our body and our spirit. Every dimension of our being is interconnected. We can't work on our mental health without addressing the physical and spiritual parts of our being. At the physical level, we have a whole laboratory of biochemistry going on in our body that regulates every physiological function and system within it. Neurotransmitters and hormones affect the function and signaling of every cell in our body. In previous episodes, I've spoken about the importance of the enteric brain, which is the microbiome that exists in our gut and how 90% of the serotonin in our body is made by this organ, as well as 50% of the dopamine and many other major neurotransmitters. Dopamine is known as the feel-good hormone that gives you a sense of pleasure. It also gives you the motivation to do something when you're feeling pleasure. Serotonin is known as the happy hormone that creates a long-lasting feeling of happiness or well-being. Both chemicals act as hormones that help to coordinate a plethora of other physiological functions throughout the body. Serotonin regulates your appetite, your sleep, emotions, your temperature, memory and learning, as well as the entire digestive system. It is a modulator of so many complex systems and functions, including hormonal communication, the central nervous system, brain function, bladder control, and cardiovascular function. So what you're putting in your gut or not putting in your gut is affecting your mental health among the myriad of all these other things. And so again, where did you learn that? The shorter answer is you didn't. Can you believe that even our doctors are not taught this? And we wonder why we have an epidemic of anxiety and depression. Take a look at the standard American or Australian diet, very aptly named SAD as an acronym. You will very quickly start to see how, with this Western diet, we're feeding up the pathogenic bacterial species in our gut with cheap energy such as sugar and flour and killing the beneficial species by not feeding them the variety and quantity of plant fibres they need to grow and survive. So we inevitably end up with dysbiosis of the microbiome in our gut, which leads to all of the digestive conditions that we have diagnosis for out there. You name it, IBS, IBD, which is Crohn's and colitis, GERD or GORD, indigestion, gastroparesis, diverticulitis, and SIBO. And then further on down the line, we have leaky gut, which is the beginning of autoimmune disease. When our microbiome is out of balance, then so too are all the neurotransmitters they produce. Neurotransmitters facilitate the communication from one cell to another. And when that doesn't happen or get through, you have dysfunction. Research scientists have also discovered that the activity of this enteric brain and the metabolites it produces are connected to the human brain via a direct physical pathway along the vagus nerve and the central nervous system. So there you have it. The old expression, you are what you eat, has just been taken to a whole new level. And I've also produced a course about balancing your microbiome and healing SIBO, which came after my son was debilitated for two and a half years, unable to attend school and in bed for most of that time. So if you have any digestive issues and you want to optimize your physical and mental health, you might want to check that out. It's also included in the Mind Scholars membership. Now, moving on to the spiritual part of our being, of primary importance is the need to set the direction, purpose and meaning in our life. So where's that in our curriculum? Once again, It's not. We need to set the broken bone first before we go and get physiotherapy, which means we need to rework whatever trauma that we've been through, whether that be little T or big T trauma. 
and put that back into place in order to set a strong foundation and to show people that they're not broken and they are 100% inherently worthy by virtue of the fact they were made man or human to be politically correct. Every dimension of our being is interconnected. Unless we address this non-physical spiritual part of our being, we surrender ourselves exclusively to the physical domain, which is subject to atrophy and entropy, which is the eventual and inevitable breakdown of systems over time, the impermanence of all things. But the soul or spiritual part of our being rises above all of that to be the one constant eternal life force that survives everything else. This realm is the opposite to the one our physical world presents to us. We need this balance in our lives to function in health and harmony, living in a world of relativity. None of us are getting out of here alive, both figuratively and literally. Life is both majestic and tragic. We will all come across trauma and challenging times. The unfortunate part is we aren't educated on it, and so therefore we're not equipped in knowing how to process it, which means we're just left to work with the more primitive and primal part of our brain that reacts in having to adapt in whatever way it can just to survive. This then leads to the behavioural adaptations a person will develop to address this confusion the mind is unable to resolve. Part of the challenge with any trauma is the mind doesn't have a schema it recognises to solve for a particular problem. And so it tries to adapt and keep you safe through compensatory behaviours, which will have you weaving and ducking and diving to keep you out of harm's way. Now, this threat could simply be in the form of a painful negative emotion. When our brain receives a threat response from a fearful thought or a fearful event or situation, it doesn't know whether that threat is being perceived or if it's real, as in the lions in the room with you. So we're continually being re-traumatized by the activation of this fear threat response from the painful thought or image or flashback, which is now on autopilot, stuck in a holding pattern loop while it tries to make sense of the traumatic event whilst keeping you safe at the same time in whatever way it can, which is sounding a lot like PTSD. So we go and medicalize it by defining it as a psychiatric disorder, which to me speaks of something that is quite sinister and beyond our control, which is terrifying. Who would want to own up to that? The reality is it's quite normal to be going through the pattern of PTSD if we don't yet have a schema that our mind can recognize to make sense of it all. So while ever it stays spinning and trying to resolve and process this disturbance, it will have you staying on high alert to thwart this threat that it doesn't yet understand. And one of its possible theories is that there might be something wrong and broken with you, which is rubbish. When you take someone through the process of making sense of that event and you lay the foundations of why and how it happened, which is in effect creating a schema or cognitive framework that helps to organize and interpret the information, it helps to bring a sense of order, rationale and reason to an otherwise messed up tragic situation. This may involve a process of having to challenge the biases and beliefs that may have been formed through a skewed interpretation of that experience so that it fits within a more holistic, larger view of the world as opposed to that particular event being representative of the world. So it makes perfect sense that when someone comes across a trauma that they don't yet have a schema for, their mind will continue to spin on it and remain on high alert until it can make sense of it all. This unresolved event can present in the form of intrusive thoughts or flashbacks as it attempts to revisit that which it's confused about. Another symptom is avoidance of people, places, activities, objects, and situations that trigger distressing memories as a protective measure 
to ensure that you're not going to be exposed to this fear threat environment that your mind is yet to reconcile. Another symptom is alterations in arousal and reactivity, which may include being overly watchful of one's surroundings in a suspecting way, being easily startled, problems with concentration or sleeping, also irritable and angry outbursts. So if we were to look at these symptoms in isolation of the surrounding context, it might seem a bit odd. But when you see how the mind is just doing its job in trying to keep us safe while it continues to sort, categorize and develop a schema or framework that it's able to compartmentalize the events into, it then becomes a very natural reaction or cause and effect cycle that's been put into motion. Once there is sufficient separation in time from the events, this is something that can be explored in a very safe, controlled and therapeutic way. And only then can the mind get out of this reactive fight or flight state and be put to rest by grounding it in a schema that makes sense. So we've touched on some psychological and biological causes involved in mental health. But before I go into the spiritual, I just want to explore the stigma surrounding mental health a bit further. And I think here it's useful to uncover the history of mental health and what's been lurking in the background across the ages of time. A quick look back at the beliefs and understandings in how we've treated and viewed mental health as a species, backdating to prehistoric and ancient cultures, we find they held a supernatural view of abnormal behaviour. They saw it as the work of evil spirits, demons, gods or witches who took control of the person. It was thought to be a form of demonic possession and the treatment for such in the cave-dwelling days included techniques such as trephination, in which a stone instrument known as a trephine was used to remove part of the skull to create an opening that evil spirits could escape through, relieving them of their mental affliction. The early Greek, Hebrew, Egyptian and Chinese cultures used a method called exorcism, in which evil spirits were cast out through prayer, magic, flogging, starvation or noise-making. Then in around 400 BC, the Greek physician Hippocrates rejected the idea of demonic possession and said that mental health disorders were akin to physical ailments and had natural causes. He thought they arose from brain pathology, whether by head trauma, brain dysfunction or disease. Interestingly, he postulated that four main fluids directed normal brain functioning and personality and that mental disorders occurred when these fluids were in a state of imbalance. Hippocrates believed mental illnesses could be treated as any other disorder by focusing on the underlying pathology. I like his thinking, and I think he was very close in some respects. If you substitute this imbalance in fluids theory that he had for an imbalance in the microbiome of the gut, then on the biological side of things, he would be very close. And in a previous episode, 25, titled The Importance of the Enteric Brain, I talk about the research work between neurotransmitters produced by the gut in the microbiome and the link with an imbalance in the different microbial species within mental health. This is mediated by the physical connection of the vagus nerve that links the gut with the brain. For example, the dysregulation of serotonin, GABA, dopamine and glutamate levels, which are all neurotransmitters produced in the gut, are also associated with disorders like anxiety. Recent studies provide evidence that gut microbiota affects anxiety symptoms. Administration with probiotics such as Lactobacillus raminus was shown to regulate the mRNA levels of GABA in distinct regions of the brain, including the cortex, hippocampus, and the amygdala, which showed to improve anxiety and depression-like behaviours in mice. Meanwhile, Dysregulation of the dopamine system has also been characterised in schizophrenia. Patients with schizophrenia exhibit increased abundance of gut anaerobes, which can survive in the presence or absence of oxygen. 
Mice transplanted with fecal microbiota from patients with schizophrenia exhibit impaired learning and memory abilities that mimic those observed in the donors. These mice also exhibited lower serum levels of tryptophan and serotonin, as well as higher levels of dopamine and serotonin in the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus. Studies also found the presence of a single species, Streptococcus vestibularis, which is associated with schizophrenia, was sufficient to induce schizophrenia-like social behaviours in recipient mice. It was found that patients with depression exhibited dysregulation of GABA, serotonin and dopamine levels. Patients with depression also exhibited increased intestinal leakage and bacterial translocation, implying the low-level inflammatory reaction caused by the intestinal leakage can lead to altered brain function and behaviour. It was also shown that a transplantation of faecal microbiota from a mouse model of depression will induce depressive-like behaviours in germ-free recipient mice. And with the administration of probiotic lactobacillus plantarium, they were able to restore normal behaviour. The autism spectrum disorder has been found to be associated with dysregulation of glutamate, dopamine and serotonin in the brains of patients. Increases in very specific gut bacteria have been identified and detected in patients with autism. Recent studies have focused on establishing rodent models of autism using fecal transplantation from children with autism, which enabled the investigation of the causal relationship between the gut microbiota and autism symptoms. Moving on from Hippocrates and the microbiome, we then have the Middle Ages from 500 AD to 1500 AD, where the progress that was made during the time of the Greeks and Romans was quickly reversed with the increase in power of the church and the fall of the Roman Empire. Scientific and medical explanations were discarded and mental illness was cast back into the Dark Ages and yet again explained as possession by the devil, which very consequently the church tried to protect us from. And treatments such as exorcism, flogging, prayer, chanting, holy sites and holy water were used to rid the person of this demonic influence. In extreme cases, the afflicted were exposed to confinement, beatings and even execution. The classic burning and hanging and strangulation of women that they thought were witches were performed during this period. Towards the end of this reign, government officials regained some of their lost power and science and medicine were called back in to try and explain psychopathology. During the Renaissance period from the 14th to the 16th centuries, the rise of humanism or the worldview that emphasises human welfare and the uniqueness of the individual gained some traction. And so places of refuge for the mentally ill were created. Hospitals and monasteries were converted into asylums, although their intent at the beginning was benign. As they started to become overcrowded, the patients came to be treated more like animals than people. Patients were chained up, placed on public display, and often heard crying out in pain. This started the rise of the moral treatment movement, which occurred in the 18th to 19th centuries. The earliest proponent was Francis Penal, a superintendent in charge of a hospital for the mentally ill in Paris. He stressed respectful treatment and moral guidance for their individuals' social and occupational needs. This movement fell due to the rise of the mental hygiene movement, which then focused on physical well-being of patients. Dorothy Dix led this movement after she observed the deplorable conditions suffered by those in mental hospitals while teaching Sunday school to female prisoners. She motivated people and state legislators to do something about this injustice and raised millions of dollars to build over 30 more appropriate mental hospitals and improve others. In 1908, Clifford Beers published his book titled A Mind That Found Itself, in which he described his struggle with bipolar disorder and the cruel and inhumane treatment people with mental illnesses received. He witnessed and experienced horrific abuse at the hands of his caretakers, and at one point he was placed in a straitjacket for 21 consecutive nights. In the early 1950s, Mental Health America issued a call to asylums across the country 
for their discarded chains and shackles. These were melted down to recast them into a 300-pound bell, which serves as a powerful reminder that the invisible chains of misunderstanding and discrimination continue to bind people with mental health. And I really still do believe this to be the case. Most of the scientific medical studies on mental health focus on a pill to treat the symptom, which is now a multi-trillion dollar industry for the pharmaceutical giants. This is at odds to Hippocrates' belief that it should be treated as any other disorder by focusing on the underlying pathology. How many people have been to the doctor for depression or anxiety alone and had their microbiome profile mapped, their diet explored, or their deficiencies investigated to find out what that underlying pathology is? My guess is never. This is our front line of healthcare with zero investigations into any underlying pathology. It seriously is a broken system that desperately needs overhauling before all the governments around the world go broke in propping up the ever burgeoning healthcare blowouts. All of it is unsustainable and seriously outdated. I could go on and on about it, but we are running out of time. I do hope, though, that it has opened your eyes to a much bigger, broader view of health in mind, body, and spirit. You cannot separate one without the other. When you get this and address all aspects of our being, a whole new level of vitality and well-being will open up to you in ways that will wow you. All of it is available to you. This is the work that we do over at Mind Scholars. So if you're interested in joining me there, you can visit themindmanual.com forward slash join to find out more. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.